We're going to continue what we started talking about yesterday about the um, role of physical therapists in um, going to schools, public schools, in order to assist students with musculoskeletal deformities. Uh, just a brief refreshment about what we spoke about yesterday with the, um, the introduction um, about um, musculoskeletal deformity assessment in the school system. And we started with the objectives and we mentioned so many of them. Uh, just for the sake of saving time, we'll just go briefly over some of them. Number one issue is just to identify the kids with problems. Number two is to help them get the cure they need. Number three is just at least if there is no cure for the deformity, if the deformity is a structural one, is a fixed one, your role will be in postponing the complication or stopping, preventing the complication from happening and taking place. And number four is just to take your um, community to the next step of uh, toward being a uh, developed uh, community or developed country instead of being a developing one. Because um, if you go to consider yourself as pioneers in Egypt, you're not pioneers all over the world because too many countries do actually screen kids for too many problems such as uh, musculoskeletal deformities, uh, hearing deficits and visual impairment and these kind of things. So um, number four object or five, uh, regardless of the number, um, you're going to have other people come after you and take other milestone steps like yours, like the ones you took. And um, uh, uh, these people will be able to use the record and the data you actually gathered. And um, from another perspective, when you go there, you will actually be the role model for other specialities in order for them to start sending ENT doctors and um, eye doctors uh, for uh, uh, schools in order for them to be able to screen students for visual impairment or hearing impairment. Uh, the other objective we mentioned yesterday was the fact that when you go to the school system uh, trying to identify kids with musculoskeletal problems, you take your ergonomic uh, vision with you, you take your ergonomic uh, background with you and start talking to teachers, uh, principals, and administrators, and students and even parents, if you get to uh, meet with them, uh, about the proper way of sitting, the proper way of standing, and how to maintain your body alignment uh, in standing, uh, sitting, and walking, and how to use your body mechanics the best efficiently uh, while you uh, perform any kind of activity. Uh, the other thing is, the other objective we mentioned yesterday was the fact that, I, uh, from my own experience in Egypt since coming from America, was the fact that I noticed that too many uh, people do not send their kids kids with disabilities or kids with deformities to schools. And when you have your own vision of uh, talking to these kind of parents, you convince them with the fact that uh, everybody deserves, every student, every child deserves to be uh, sent to school in order for him not to miss. Because I've encountered too many kids who are very, very intellectual, very, very smart, very intelligent. But because of being deformed or having a deformity or having a syndrome or having a severe case of cerebral palsy, their, their families do actually keep them at home. Uh, after we spoke about the objectives of our goal to the school system, we spoke about some kind of uh, basic information for all of us, and we stated the fact that every one of us, in order to be able to assess any patient in the whole planet, regardless if you're talking about a child, a baby, an infant, or an adult, you have to consider five very important points. Number one is symmetry, number two is body alignment, and number three is strength, and number four is range of motion, and number five is pain, okay? And we said uh, these kind of principles are very, very important for all of us to consider and to keep in mind, regardless of the patient we see. And we did actually mention the fact that these kind of principles should be in your mind even while being at home or even while walking in the street. You just, you can pick on the person who have like a neck pain and you can tell this patient or this person uh, has a neck pain and you can walk in the street and you see a person who's limping and you can tell exactly where is the problem. Is it the foot, is it the knee, is it the hip? Because of what we just uh, spoke about uh, just now. Uh, we did actually talk about um, axes and planes and we said that um, these are very, very important and we're gonna know the value of talking and um, mentioning uh, every single plane and every single axis and because we're gonna definitely use this kind of information uh, today. Uh, yesterday we did actually uh, start talking after the introduction about uh, the uh, different topics that we will be looking at in the school system and we said yesterday that when we go to the school system we're going to be looking at um, deformities in the spine 
and we defined scoliosis, kyphosis, and hyperlordosis. And then we said we're gonna be uh, assessing uh, or identifying kids with overweight, obesity, and the only reason from my point of view uh, that we have to keep in mind uh, identifying kids with uh, obesity as well is the fact that uh, these kind of kids do actually suffer from or consider from a researcher perspective as people who do have as people who do have um, uh, chronic chronic um, diseases and uh, this have a very very uh, great negative impact on the psychology of the student who goes to school among other kids who do not have the same problem and the most of the time they pick on him and the child um, level of education might be affected because of uh, this and we mentioned the fact that um, um, uh, we spoke also about accumulative trauma disorder and we said back in the days we used to uh, talk about accumulative trauma disorder as a problem that affects adults but uh, uh, does not affect uh, kids but recently we start seeing too many kids uh, do actually hurt themselves uh, because of the because of the extra use or the overuse of the touch screen devices so you can encounter a child um, uh, who is like uh, suffering from neck pain severe neck pain or uh, severe low back pain because of uh, using the uh, touch screen devices for too many hours a day. Hmm? Yeah, of course. We did actually uh, talk about um, spina bifida, and we mentioned the fact that the main goal of us in order to help our community when we go to the school system, in addition to the um, um, deformities that any child not any child, but some of the children with a spina bifida might have, is the fact that any mother who uh, did actually give birth to a child with a spina bifida can actually give birth to other kids with a spina bifida in different degrees. It doesn't have to be the same degree. It could be a worse or it could be a way better degree than the first baby. So if we encounter a child with a deformity because of uh, having a spina bifida, we do actually have to communicate with the family, communicate with the parents, and start talking to them about the need for the mother to uh, plan for her pregnancy. Uh, every mother or any mother who did actually experience having a baby with a spina bifida should actually start consulting the doctor before uh, conceiving in order for her to uh, do what she can in order to uh, prevent the problem to happen uh, or at least um, decrease the effect uh, by taking the vitamins needed from the specialist. We did actually talk about for classified scoliosis. Um, they, we did actually before going back to scoliosis, we spoke about traumatoid juvenile uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, one other thing we spoke about yesterday. Anybody remember the last topic we spoke about? Let us get back to scoliosis, and then we're gonna remember when we spoke about scoliosis. Very important for us to uh, speak about the too many different ways of classifying scoliosis because if you look at too many uh, references or textbooks or these kind of things. When you talk to different specialties and different professions, one might talk about uh, scoliosis based on its uh, shape, based on its uh, location, based on the magnitude of the curve, based on the degree of the curve, and uh, or based on the um, age of the child or the person who does have the scoliosis. And we spoke in details about all of this uh, yesterday. I hope you guys remember all the info we spoke about yesterday. So the, all the topics we spoke about yesterday, uh, after we finish all of that, we start talking about basics of assist. And from my perspective now, we have eight questions in mind that we're gonna start today's lecture with. And uh, all of these questions are about the deformity because we go into the school system now with the deformity perspective in mind to assist the student from top to bottom, looking at the student, looking at the student from top to bottom, assisting the student for all kind of deformities, uh, no matter what kind of deformity is. So number one deformity, we have to be able to identify if there is a deformity or not, okay? And the perspective I have in mind, yesterday we spoke about physiological deformities and pathological deformities. I can see a child who does have a physiological deformity with the lower extremities and then identify this a child with a permanent or fixed or structural deformity, that's a huge mistake. As we stated earlier, we have to understand the norm in order to be able to identify the abnormal. If we do not know the normal, we're not gonna be able to identify the abnormal. So 
with this point, just to give a brief um, example for this, and we're gonna go to the details later on. Yesterday we spoke about kids with uh, bow legs, that uh, these kind of kids can be, uh, normally speaking, they can actually be born with, more, all, all babies are actually born with 10 to 15 degrees of genome bear. Uh, okay, so every single child look like um, having some kind of uh, bow leg deformity since birth. But this kind of, this is the physiology part of the physiological part of the deformity. And um, uh, this kind of problem reaches its peak by the age of 12 months when the child just starts standing and walking and bearing weight uh, on his feet. This kind of physiologic bow legs start to transform and go to the neutral position of the lower extremities in a standard by the age of two years old. Okay, so we have to understand that from zero day or zero month till the age of 12 month, we are actually dealing with a physiologic bow leg deformity. Okay, and then this, the same exact um, uh, deformity that we consider as physiologic start to transform and change into uh, the neutral position of having both uh, lower extremities aligned in the normal position. Not the normal for the adult person, but the normal for the baby, for this specifically, for, for the, the population we're talking about. After that, this neutral position will start to transform it into a valgus deformity. Okay, we're talking about another kind of normal deformity in the lower extremities. Okay, and this valgus deformity will reach its peak by the age of from three years old to four years old. So we, 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 when we talk about deformities with the newborn, we're dealing with a bow leg deformity that is normal, that is physiologic, and then it transforms, it change into the neutral position, and then the same child will transform into another kind of valgus deformity, which is like some sort of getting the knees closer and getting the tibias uh, in the opposite side, of the bow leg deformity, uh, but we will consider it as a normal deviation till the age of between three and four, and then the same child will correct this kind of deformity to the normal ratio, to the normal degree that a normal adult person will have, which is like uh, seven degrees, or from seven to 12. Any kind of degree less than 15 degree will be considered normal if you notice some kind of uh, uh, bow leg issue. Um, by the age of eight to nine years old. And this is the population you guys are going to assess, okay? So if you see a problem with a child after the age of nine, and as we stated earlier, symmetry, if the child, if the problem is asymmetrical, so that's a problem, we're, gonna, we're not gonna talk about any physiologic issue as long as we have an asymmetry, because whatever we mention about a normal child that is having a physiologic deformity with the both lower extremities, we're talking about identical shape of both legs, identical shape of both sides of the body. If there is a difference in uh, the um, one leg than the other, we, we're not talking about symmetry, we're talking about asymmetry. So if asymmetry exists, even right after birth, we have a problem. That's why we're talking uh, very serious about, we have to understand the norm Okay, in order to be able to identify the abnormal. If there is an asymmetry, if there is a restriction in range, if there is a decrease in function, if there is a, because when we spoke yesterday about asymmetry or symmetry of the human body, we spoke about three different things that relate to symmetry. Shape and size and function. Three different things. So if, if the deformity we have in hand, uh, the child look in front of us as symmetrical, so we don't have a problem as long as we are uh, assessing the child within the range of age that the uh, deformity is normal, is considered to be normal. But if the child exceeds this kind of age and having an asymmetry going on, having a um, uh, lack of function on one side, on the affected side, if the child is having like a restricted range, if the child is having some sort of pain while you're trying to manipulate or move the affected part, um, we do actually have a problem. So we have to be able to identify if there is a problem, if there is a deformity or not, because we it's a very, very bad thing for us to go there and identify a normal physiologic uh, change and consider it as a deformity. Okay, number two, 
what is the deformity? Okay, we stated the fact that this child actually have a problem, have a deformity. Okay, but what kind of deformity? Does it relate, if we talk about the lower extremity, does it relate to the foot? Does it relate to the leg? Does it relate to the uh, thigh? Does it relate to the femur? Because if we consider looking and assessing deformities with the lower extremities, we can talk about two different categories. Torsional or angular, okay? Torsional deformities, as we stated just a few minutes ago, the bow leg deformity, okay? The in toeing, the out toeing, the femoral antiversion, all of these categories can actually, um, we can uh, talk about under the um, uh, torsional uh, appearance of the lower extremities. But if we talk about angular issues with the lower extremities, we're gonna be talking about some sort of knees and stuff like this. Femoral antiversion would be considered as the torsional part, a very, very important one of the torsional issues because let me just make it a bit simpler for you. Forget all about torsional and angular, okay? Look at the lower extremities as um, being in in towing or out towing, okay? If you look at in towing, this in towing problem with the lower extremities might be due to something to do with the foot, something to do with the leg, or something to do with the thigh. Okay, starting from the foot. The foot is towing in, so what happened to the foot? What causes this towing in with the foot? Metatarsus abductus. Okay? Okay, what happened to the leg? Internal tibial torsion. What happened to the femur? Femoral antiversion. Okay? This is the in -tone. Every single thing that happened with the in -tone relates to the part of the body that causes it. So internal tibial torsion, metatarsus abduxus at the forefoot, tibial torsion at the tibia, femoral antiversion at the femur, and metatarsus abduxus at the foot, all of these problems can cause in tone. So we don't have to just go there and say um, the child is suffering from in tone. We have to be very specific, a little tiny very specific. Is it the forefoot? Is it the tibia? Or is it the femur? Okay? Every single one of these have its own uh, assessment, have a way for us to measure, and we're going to get to it. But, but can I just apply the first for this antiversion? Could the door end up going to the door end or go end towards the antiversion? That's a good view. That's why we said we're going to take every single part of the body and do our own measurement. When, when we come to the part of the uh, lecture that we're going to be talking about measurement, we're going to be actually assessing the foot itself, the tibia itself, and the femur itself. The only thing I have in mind is the time. I hope the time itself will allow. So, um, so we, we stated the fact that the child has a problem. We have to be very specific. What kind of problem is it? I have to be able to say, okay, the child uh, has metatarsus abduxus because of this toe and end of the uh, foot, of the forefoot. It's a purely metatarsus abduxus. One very simple thing, just for you to identify. If you look at the tibia, the shin bone, and the, uh, the tuberosity, and you see it right in the middle. Okay. It's not actually rotated in, and we do have our own assessment way of measuring it, okay? That's one thing for you to consider, the involvement of the tibia itself, okay? If you see the shin bone facing forward, right, forward, but you notice the fact that the femur itself, the thigh itself from the top is actually rotating in, that's another thing for you to be able to. If you look at the foot itself and you see the lateral border of the foot flat, straight, definitely there is no toe in in the forefoot of, the, uh, of this baby. But if you look at the outer side of the foot and you see it looks like a convex curve, so we're actually talking about metatarsus abductus. So we do have our own way of looking at things and being very, very specific, but things will come up uh, Bit by bit by bit during this lecture. So which is the plane of deformity? This is the fact that we spoke about axes and planes yesterday because when we talk about the plane of the deformity, yesterday we said if we consider asking for an x-ray for a scoliotic curve, what kind of view we should ask for? At least two view. AP. Oh, yeah, at least two view for any kind of problem you assess in. Okay, as a requirement, basic requirement for x-ray. But now we're talking about which, um, which image will show the scoliotic curve, the AP view, okay? And this is, 
the, this why the scoliotic curve itself will show very obvious if you stand behind the student, okay? If you stand in front of the student, you would see, you would see the uneven shoulder level. You will see the uneven pelvic level. And this kind of, all of these details will go through. But um, we should be able to assess the, uh, the planes where the deformity take place because we should be able to assess the movement. One of you guys yesterday asked it, if we assess in scoliosis, why shall we ask the student to lay on his back and to lay on his stomach? And I stated the fact that when we assess a student, we do not actually assess one thing. We should actually look at the whole body because you might, one, one very obvious thing might grab your attention in the first moment, but how about if there are, there are too many other things that are going on with the same child? How about if the child is suffering from a syndrome? How about if the child is suffering from a systemic disease that um, the, the problem that you noticed at the beginning is just one of, out of three or four, okay? So we will consider looking at all kind of movement, all kind of planes. If you notice one deformity, assess this part, and see if the deformity in this part is affecting any other part of the body and forcing this part to uh, compensate with any other deformity, okay? So knowing the, the plane of deformity is very important for us. How severe is the deformity? It's very, very important for, for us at purpose because if the deformity is still fixed, if the deformity is still malleable, Okay, you can play a huge role in helping this child in taking care of the problem. But if you're dealing with a fixed deformity, that whenever you move the joint to assess the range, you find a very hard bony block on the way. So surgery would be the only option most of the time. Okay, so identifying how severe the problem is, how flexible the deformity is, is very important for us as physical therapists. Why there is a deformity? Is it a localized one, or as I stated earlier, a part of a systemic problem? Does the child have a spina bifida that is affecting the foot? Does the child have super palsy that is affecting the hand? Uh, um, does the child have, no matter what other disease that the child is suffering from, okay, that is affecting this part or any other part in the whole uh, body? The question number seven about deformity, any consequence of the deformity? Is there any other deformity in the human body that comes as a consequence for the first one? And the last question about deformity, when does it occur? Does it happen while the child is fixed? Does it show all the time? Or does it only show while the child is moving? Okay? Because we understand from our uh, background that um, if there is a deformity in the joint itself, definitely this deformity will change by moving. But if there is a deformity in the bone, no matter how you move the extremity, the deformity with the bone will remain the same. Now, four other very important things to consider while assessing kids uh, for musculoskeletal deformities. And um, this part of the lecture is very, very easy and simple because we do actually do this on a daily basis. And number one is an inspection. We have to observe the child. We have to look at the whole child. As we mentioned yesterday, we have to look at the child while standing, while walking, while sitting, while laying on his back, while laying in his stomach. We have to assess the, the appearance of the whole body, uh, considering the fact that when you look at the child, while assessing the child, we have to look at the, um, the head. Is the head straight, right in the middle, aligned with the body, or the head is tilted or rotated to one side? That's number one thing. Number two, going down to the shoulder. Are the shoulders even on one level, or one of them is higher than the other? One of them is lower than the other. And then going down, the angle of the scapula, the scapula, the level of the two scapulas, is one uh, of them like uh, protruding more than the other? Are they even? Is there one of them like um, in a higher level than the other, or a lower level than the other? And then look at the spine itself. Is it right in the middle? or is it deviated laterally, as the case of scoliosis? Or if you look at from the lateral view and you look at the kyphotic curve, is it like a normal curve, physiologic curve that every one of us have in the thoracic spine, or is it a pathological one in a child who's uh, supposed to be um, referred to the specialist in order to get the help he or she needs? Going down to the iliac crest, is there any pelvic tilt in the child who is standing in front of you? And then 
going down to the ankles, to the uh, feet, to the knees, seeing and noticing if there's any knock knee problem, bow leg problem, um, um, talibus equine various with the foot, the tarsus, abductus, any other deformity with the whole body. So when we look at the beginning, we have to look at the whole body. We have to look from all kinds of views. We have to ask the student to stand, to sit, to walk. We have to stand in front of the child. We have to stand in behind of the child. We have to stand on the right side of the child, on the left of the side of the child. And of course, we see the fact that these kind of children, why Venus is, should be wearing shorts in order for us to have as much uh, exposure to our eyes as we can. Second one of our assessment of any kind of deformity is palpation. We have to palpate the soft tissues, we have to palpate the bones, we have to palpate the joints in order for us to be able to tell, to talk about the symmetry, to talk about the flexibility of the deformity. So palpation is number two issue. And number three is to assess range of motion, to assess movement. And as we stated earlier, not only in the part that we notice that it does have a problem, it does have a deformity, we do actually should have to assess all kind of range in the whole body, okay? Because maybe there's something that we did not notice at the beginning, but when you ask the child to do gross movement of the upper extremities, okay, gross movement of the lower extremities, it's not gonna take you uh, too much time, but you will be able to identify if there's a restriction in the specific part that you identify the problem with or in any other part of the body. We should uh, actually, while assessing movement, we should assess as we've been doing, passive range and active range, and we should um, uh, notice any kind of pain, any kind of tenderness that uh, happens and take uh, place because of the restriction of movement. Then it comes to measurement. We spoke about measuring uh, deformities, some kind of techniques we should be doing in order for us to uh, measure different kinds of deformity. Let us, just for the sake of time, if we talk about bow legs, for example, what kind of measurement we should do? Bow legs, what kind of measurement we should do? The distance between what? And bow legs, the child with hmm? the two malleoli. Okay, so we should be asking the student to lay on his back? No. The student has to be standing, okay, bearing weight on both lower extremities, and then ask the student to uh, get his feet together, get his knees together, okay? The, the presence of the deformity itself is not gonna allow the knees to come close. Uh, we're talking about bow legs, sorry, we are actually going to measure the distance between the two condyles, okay? The two condyles, bow legs, we're going to be measuring the distance between the two condyles. So uh, the student himself is not gonna get his feet, he's, he's not gonna get his knees uh, close to each other because of the deformity itself, if it is a fixed one, uh, while he's standing. But um, otherwise, the student would be able to get his knees together the way he does actually get his uh, feet together. If there is any degree of uh, bow legs, you guys will take the measurement between the two condyles, okay? The two medial condyles of the two uh, femurs and measure it and see exactly how much distance uh, the student has between the two legs. Any question? Uh, what if I uh, expect the vision of the student in normal hearing position? I think most of the deformity or most of the injury more obvious in good hearing position. Okay, we said earlier that we should do all of these positions at the beginning. Okay, we should ask the student to stand, to ambulate, to sit, and to lay on his back and to lay on his stomach. And you should observe and inspect all body parts, all joints, all bones, okay? And the spine, extremities and the spine. But now we already identified the problem with the child. With this specific problem, weight bearing should happen, weight bearing should take place, okay? You have to assess this kind of problem, the whole leg problem and the knock knee problem in a standard not in while laying down, okay? So in order for you to get the exact measurement, you have to measure the space between the two condyles of the femur, two medial condyles of the femur. Uh, now you're going to assess and take the measurement for knock knees. So the distance between, and the standing as well, the distance between the two manuli. You have to measure the distance between the two manuli, ask the student to stand in front of you, to get his feet as close as possible to each other, and his knees as close as possible to each other, okay? Knees are already close, okay? But feet, they will not be close. 
uh, and you take the measurement between the two manually. Not me. Not me. Yeah. Not me. Two manual. The distance between the two manual. Bow leg, you take the distance between the two from that. Um, okay. Um, leg length discrepancy. What shall we do in order for us to identify or measure? How would we measure leg length discrepancy in a children? Just consider the fact that we might encounter a child with a true leg length discrepancy or a functional leg length discrepancy. And the difference between both of them is huge, is big. True leg length discrepancy is an actual uh, leg length difference between the right and the left. Okay? Yeah. But the, 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 the functional one is, is not an actual, not a real one. Okay? There is something else that is going on. There is no difference between the length of the femur in both sides. There is no difference between the length of the tibias in both sides. But the problem has to do with the pelvis itself. Could be there is a pelvic thing going on. Could be uh, muscle spasm with the back muscles and shifting the uh, pelvis to one side. Um, could be too many other reasons, but there is no difference in the length of bones between one side and the other. So how can we measure uh, leg length discrepancy? We can actually take the measurement in two different ways. Uh, one of them is taking the whole length at one time, starting from the zebra stern. Do you want to have a question? No. Okay. Um, so you take the measure from the zip sternum, or what we call the cyphoid process, to the inferior border of the medial manula. Okay? That's one way of measuring leg length discrepancy. And the other one is to take the measurement from the inferior border uh, of the uh, tuosphere spine to the inferior border of the medial manula. But how can we take measurement in a true leg length discrepancy? and uh, uh, a functional one. If you notice that your child or the per person you actually assist in have a tightness problem or a um, muscle spasm somewhere that is shifting one of the legs is the change in the posture, the position of the leg. The leg, one of the legs look that it does have a problem. You, you did not identify the problem yet, but the way the child stands, the way the child walks, the way the child moves, seem like this student has a problem. What we can do with this is to do actually measure one leg, okay, and then the affected leg first, and then put the other leg, the good leg, in the same exact position as the affected leg. You get this point? Let me see, let me let me say that I have an adductor, AD doctor spasticity with the right lower extremity. So my leg will look like this. Okay? So I will take the measurement from this leg in this position because I cannot force it. If I can't force it to come to have both legs parallel, that's fine. Okay, we're gonna have a problem. But how about if I don't have, there's a dislocation going on or some sort of uh, restriction that uh, is not allowing me to move this affected leg. What can I do? I wanna make sure that both legs are equal and um, like talking about bone wise. So when I measure this leg, I cannot force it to come parallel to the other one, the non-affected one. So I have to put the non-affected one in the same position as the affected one in order for me to measure it in the other in the in the right way. For me to tell if there is a real actually real difference in bone length or not. Is this point clear? Time. So when we after we finish with measuring the um, leg length discrepancy um, one other question, question will come up. This leg length discrepancy, is it, does it come from the difference of length in both femurs or does it come from a difference in length in both tibias? Okay. How can we differentiate? This, this point is very easy. Yeah. Good. That's it, exactly. So if the tibia is longer, the knee itself will protrude upward, but if the femur is longer, the femur itself will protrude this way. Okay, that's one way of telling exactly. Of course, before we assess any child or any person with a uh, leg length discrepancy, we have to make sure that he's completely aligned on the surface he's laying on. Okay, make sure that do your best to align the pelvis. Ask the student to bend his knees and lift his pelvis up. Do the bridging exercise. 
just to make sure that the student collected himself together. Nothing is stopping his body from being aligned, okay? Don't just ask him, okay, straighten yourself up and put your feet together and stuff like this. Before all of that, just ask the uh, student to have his feet even, okay? Bend his both knees and keep this, um, uh, this level of uh, the, um, the feet together. And then ask the students while having his knees bent and his uh, both hips bent to bridge his um, back or his pelvis all the way up. And uh, with this kind of thing, at, right after this student finish, just ask him to straighten his legs up. Make sure that uh, both feet are even and then take your measurement. Okay.